And if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like you to turn to Revelation chapter 9. For our guest today, we are walking through the book of Revelation. We are taking it verse by verse and line by line, and we are seeing what God's Word is saying to us. I have no idea how, how long it's going to take to get through it, but we are going to go. Uh, I'm really hoping Jesus will come before we get through with it. Amen. Wouldn't it be cool if in like chapter 22, boom, here he comes, you know, right when we finish it. And listen, folks, God can do anything. I hope you understand that. In Revelation 9, we are going to talk today about the sixth trumpet. Uh, we have looked at the trumpets, and uh, before that we looked at the seals, and the bowls are coming along, and all these are judgments of God. And you have to understand, as these judgments go by, they get stronger and stronger, and they get more harsh, okay? And some people look at, even like today, uh, the, really the judgment is death. Uh, on earth. They look at it like it's hard and, and it's almost unfair. But folks, God has given everyone a chance to hear the gospel and repent of their sins. So if someone goes to hell, it's not God's fault. God has never sent anyone to hell. He has always given us choices. It's just as the end of the world comes, it's going to take more and more to get man's attention. Matter of fact, I don't understand how somebody living today could not turn on the news for 10 minutes and see that things are going awry, that things are going crazy right now, and I believe uh, Jesus is coming draweth nigh. If you have a bulletin and want to follow along with us, the sixth trumpet, number one, the release of demons. Demonic activity is seen all through the book of Revelation. And you have to understand, these demons don't do anything that God doesn't allow them to do. He has used pagan kings to discipline his children. Pharaoh and the children of Israel is just one example. So don't be surprised towards the end of the time, and especially in the great tribulation time, these things are intense. Number two, the return of death. The return of death. Remember in the fourth seal, one-fourth of the population died. And three, the reaction of defiance. And here's what defiance means to me. That means you are ignoring God, and you would even come to the place, and people have done that, where they shook their fist in the face of God and got even angrier. Folks, I got news for you. It does not pay to be angry with God. It doesn't. And one day, judgment is coming. One day, everyone will stand before God and give an account of their life to God. So in this scripture, I want you to see, and throughout all history, uh, mankind has been influenced by two opposing forces. One is the domain of darkness, influenced by Satan and his demons. The other is light in the kingdom of of God. Everyone must make their choice, and nobody is neutral. The big issue becomes eternity. One choice will lead you to spend an eternity in hell, while the right choice will result in you going to heaven and spend an eternity with God and Jesus. These divine judgments of the seals and trumpets should make people wake up to those two realities, but still many will choose to ignore God in the last days. Our job as Christians is to share the truth of Scripture with the lost in love and present the gospel and warn people of the times to come. It, it, our text today shows us a severe demonic attack that brings death to many. May this sobering truth encourage us to be concerned about the souls of our family, our friends, and our work associates. So look at Revelation 9. Verse 13, the release of demons. And remember, this is the sixth trumpet, the three woes. Last week, the first woe we covered, and this week is the second woe. Then the sixth angel sounded, all right? The sixth angel blew his trumpet, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And when you hear a voice, 
you have to understand there are only two possibilities here. It's either one of the high-ranking angels or it's Jesus Christ himself. And I believe because Jesus broke the seal and because Jesus was orchestrating all this, this voice is Jesus telling this angel to blow its trumpet. And you notice here it says the four uh, horns of the golden altar. And we spoke about that about two weeks ago. And it talked about, uh, and we gave you a, a picture and a diagram of the temple. But the golden altar was the altar of incense. And we said that was where it, earlier in Revelation, the prayers of the saints were giving up to God. And so they were praying uh, for mercy and praying for those uh, who uh, persecuted them and executed them. But you will see in these times of judgment, that all changes, all right? The mercy seat is where the presence of God is in the original temple, all right, in the Holy of the Holies. But this represents a time when mercy is done and judgment will come. And when you read this chapter or the rest of this chapter, you will see that God is not playing here, all right? It is serious stuff. People are going to die by the millions, not hundreds, not thousands, but millions according to God's holy word. Then verse 14, saying to the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. And again, the angels respond to, to what God has told them and Jesus told them to do. And it says, release the four angels and we said earlier in Revelations, there are good angels and there are bad angels. We talked about it uh, a week ago where Satan rebelled against God. His name was Lucifer, and him and uh, a third of the angels were tossed out of heaven. Some of them were pinned up. Some of them were put away early in the Word of God. They were so wicked and they were so vile that God was saving them for a place like this. And it says, release those who are bound. And folks, that's why we know it is a demonic. All right, you don't bound good angels. You bind evil angels and evil demons. And folks, I am telling you, Hollywood has got a good grasp on what evil is. There's something. Now, why would a, you, you answer me this. Why would a Christian watch a show called Evil? I don't get that. I've never seen it. I've never seen anything as far as even a, a, a little blip of it. But folks, that is, you are silly to do that. Evil is evil, folks. And that's what we need. We as Christians need to avoid evil. We are supposed to stay away from evil. And, and here, these angels are there at the river Euphrates. And folks, the river Euphrates is really, really known in the Middle East. Let me give you some information about this river. The, the Euphrate, Euphrates River is considered to be one of the great, greatest rivers in the Bible. It is a place where the four demons are released in our text. The Euphrates River is bordered by the Garden of Eden, Egypt, Israel, and the Persian Empire. Its source begins near Mount Ararat in Turkey and flows 1,700 miles into the Persian Gulf. It was there where Adam and Eve sinned, where Cain murdered his brother Abel, and where the Tower of Babel was built. The region near the Euphrates was a central location of three world powers that oppressed Israel, Assyria, Babylon, and Medo-Persia. Uh, it is the river over which the enemies of God will cross to engage in the battle of Armageddon. The city of Babylon will be rebuilt there, which we will cover that later, and it will be the headquarters of the Antichrist. So you see these demons being released from that place. And folks, God, uh, you know, in, in Scripture and in all, all the time, you can see all the way through the Old and New Testament, things happening where the judgment of God has fallen on people. Hold your finger there and go with me to 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2. 2 Peter 2, verse 4. 
For if God did not spare the angels who had sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and that's what I was talking about earlier, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight, pre eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. If you go back to Genesis chapter 6, you will see where God literally says in the Bible, I regret that I even made man. Now, now folks, that's, a, that's harsh. But I mean, they were so wicked. They were so vile. Sin had become such a part of them that God says, I am going to, I'm going to destroy. And we all know about the flood. And we know that the rainbow is a promise from God. A promise from God that that'll never happen again. But we know he destroyed all of mankind except eight people. And then he says, in turning to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and to ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly. And we know what Sodom and Gomorrah was known for. Folks, the sin of homosexuality. And folks, it is wrong. The sin of homosexuality. Read the Word of God. Read Romans chapter 1. And God looked at this town, and I'm telling you, he literally destroyed it. Destroyed it. Look at verse 7. And delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked, for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing of their lawless deeds. And basically, that town, there were no rules. You know, it's kind of like the hippies of the 60s. All right? If it feels good, do it. Now, folks, that, that's ridiculous. It's kind of like, you know, uh, 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 just saying that, you know, whatever I think is right is right. Folks, we don't go by what man says. We go by what God says. We go by what God's Word says. And God... God uh, just literally leveled this city because of sin. Then verse 9, Then the Lord uh, knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of punishment. Even during the tribulation time. Remember, he marked his folks. He marked the 144,000. All right, he'll mark uh, the two witnesses. He protected those who were Christians even during the time of tribulation. Why? Because he still wanted them to share the gospel with others. And so we can see the release of demons in this ninth chapter of Revelation. Not only do we see the release of demons, we see the return of death. Look at verse 16. Now the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. You know, some people, and again, in Revelation, there's so many symbols, uh, there's so many things, literally and not literally, that you, you have to figure out. Some people say this, that this possi possibly could be China, because they have enough. But you have to, to me, it doesn't make sense, because even at that, folks, we're not talking about, you know, at the end times, we're not talking about the Battle of Armageddon here. That's later on down the road. And this is a worldwide issue, okay? Worldwide. So I believe it is it's speaking of those uh, demons. These are these demonic forces. And think of the number, 200 million demonic forces. Then it says, I heard the number of them. This is John talking. And thus I saw the horses in the vision and all through Revelation, John has these visions, and God is sharing these visions with us so that we as pastors and preachers and teachers can share them with others. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, calcinic blue, and sulfur yellow, and uh, were like the head of lions. Now again, get a picture in your head. They weren't just horses. I mean, a horse doesn't have a lion head. But what he is describing is the 
fierceness of what these demons are going to do and how they look. If you pictured this in your mind before you go to bed, I'm telling you, you'd have nightmares. You would have nightmares. That's why, I, that's another thing I don't get. These gory, and you're, you're in your living room, and you're all hunkered up, and you're scared, and you jump like that. Folks, that's not even entertainment. That's punishment. <laughs> nightmares. Think about what we see and what we say and where we go and what we do. All right? These are demons, folks, and we need to avoid any demonic activity in our lives. Matter of fact, I truly believe that's the way Satan gets into our... Remember, he's the prince in the power of the air? I think that's how he gets into our families, into our homes. Right through the television at times. And we don't invite him in. We don't say, hey, come in, Satan. No, but I am telling you, when these horrible-looking creatures are going on, folks, and, and parents, listen to me. You have to filter your kids' TVs, and you have to filter their phones. You are not doing right if you don't. You need to know where your kid is going and these sites that they're going to. All right, I know kids aren't going to like it. Youth aren't going to like it. But hey, I was a youth minister, and I know how youth act. All right? I was one, all right? And the Bible says, heads of lions, out of their mouths came smoke and fire and brimstone. Think about that. Smoke, fire, and brimstone. What do you think hell is made up of? Smoke, fire, and brimstone. Folks, we're talking about creatures that will just literally destroy you. They will kill you with one you know, and I don't like to compare them to fire dragons and things like that. I don't, that's not what I'm trying to compare it to. But it's literally would come out of their mouths. By these three plagues, and a third of mankind was killed. Now you think, early a, a fourth of mankind was killed in the fourth seal. Now a third of mankind uh, was killed. I had Lori Google this yesterday. She's my Googler, all right? And uh, I wish I had my flip phone on me. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she Googled it yesterday. 8.1 million, no, 8.1 billion people in the world today. So you take a one-fourth and a one-third, that means at this time over 4 billion people would have died during this tribulation time. Think of that alone. Think of that alone. Think of the stench on the earth. Think about having to bury four million people. Think about the people that are left that have to do that. Think about the disease and the things that are going on at that time. And I'm telling you folks, God has given mankind a chance. He's given them a chance. And some are just shaking their fist in God's face. And he's had enough. That's what the great tribulation is. Four billion people, according to the word of God. Now look at this. For their power, oh, well, no, I, I went too far. Look at verse 18. By these three plagues, a third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their powers in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents having heads with them that do harm. Folks, I'm telling you, it is these demonic creatures were, were just ungodly to look at. They look like lion's heads. And folks, serpents are snakes. Their tails, so they could kill you one of two ways. They could just breathe fire on you, or you could be stung by a poisonous snake, which was with their tail. And so we see all this death going on in the sixth trumpet. But here's what I have to say, folks. It almost looks like the demonic forces are winning. But I want you to go to Revelation chapter 20. I want you to remember this. And we'll study it later, but I just want to read this to you. Revelation 20, verse 7. Now, when the thousand years have expired, 
Satan will be released from his prison. And remember, we'll go through the end of the tribulation, then the battle uh, you know, of Armageddon. And he, will, he will destroy the armies and the enemies of God. And then we will go into the millennial period for a thousand years where he will pin up Satan in, in, in all his devils and demons. And there will be literally peace in Jerusalem. And he will rule from the city of David. So when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together in battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. And they went upon the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophets are. And they will be torment, tormented day and night and forever and ever. Amen. Folks, I'm telling you, when that battle of Armageddon be begins, I'm, you know, we will come back with Jesus and that is the second coming. The rapture of the church is the next thing on God's prophetic calendar. And once we are raptured out of here as Christians, I am telling you, uh, the tribulation begins. The first half. And then the great tribulation will, will go. And then at the end, this is what he's talking about. He is talking about where Satan is crushed. Okay, he is crushed in the battle of Armageddon. And he will be thrown into hell forever and ever and ever. And folks, the thing you have to understand is Satan's always going to be around here on earth. Here on earth. What would, you know, you, you just look at some of the things Satan is doing. Shootings, mass shootings have escalated by an unbelievable manner. Just the first, four, the first three days or four days of school here in Fort Smith, we had two guns, two different guns, and a knife confiscated. Kids bringing these weapons to school. And folks, all that is demonically inspired. And we have to realize that, yes, we may lose a battle of two right now, but we will win. God will win. God is going to come and make things right. He's going to come and he's going to take care of us. We will be riding with him, riding with him in victory, folks. There is victory in Jesus. Amen. So we see the release of demons. We see the return of death. And then we see the reaction of defiance. The reaction of defiance. Look at verse 20. But the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, and stone, and wood, which can neither see, nor hear, nor walk. So what is Revelation saying? Even in seeing this mass destruction in the form of death, there's still going to be sinners here that wasn't killed, that just still says, I don't care what God says. I don't care how many people die. I am not trusting in God. I don't believe in God. All right, I may die while I'm doing this, but they are rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. You know, there's two reasons people tell me that they, they have trouble witnessing. The first one is fear. They are afraid. They are afraid of. And my question is, what do we have to be afraid of? God is on our side. God speaks for us. We are representatives of God. We can't mess it up. We can't mess it up if we give our testimony and lead others to Christ. And then the other thing they are afraid of, they're afraid of rejection. They're afraid that somebody's going to say no. Hey, can I give you some news today? More people will say no than yes. I've had more people reject me in 43 years of ministry than people that have come to Christ, that I had the privilege of, uh, you know, leading to Christ. Why? Because people don't want to change. They like their lifestyle. They like what they're doing. 
They're in sin. They're enjoying sin. And this is what this whole last part is about. Mankind's not going to change other than knowing the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. The only hope they have is the gospel. And we have the gospel. We have the word of God. And our job is not to say, who, God got you. Oh, didn't he get even with you? All right, that's not our job. Let God do his job and he will do it right and he'll do it on time. It's not our job. Our job is to share the gospel with people around us. And you can say this also. Some people aren't going to change. You are right. But we still need to warn them about what is ahead. Now in this last two verses, there are five sins that he speaks of. Five sins. The first one is the sin of idols. The sin of idols. What is the first commandment? The first commandment, thou which are what? Have no other gods, little g, before you. And I know what we're thinking. Well, we don't have statues. You know, there's not a statue or sitting on my mantle, anything else. But folks, anything you put before God, capital G, O-D, is a God. I know a time in my life, you know what my, one of my idols were? Baseball. Baseball. I ate it, I drank it, I slept it. I wanted to be, I played college ball. I wanted to be drafted. And God said, I'll take care of that. My freshman year, I hit a, 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 a baseball off the center field at Cameron University in Lawton, Oklahoma, and I ran second, and the base slipped, and I broke my ankle. And then God got my attention. Anything you put before God. You know, for some people, uh, guys, it could be your golf clubs. I'm serious. Now, now I know I'm getting personal here. But if you care more about golfing than you do about going to church, there's something wrong there. There can be all kinds of gods in our lives, folks. What do you put before God? It's an idol. It's an idol. Gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. So then he says, and they did not repent of their, and here's the ones that will really show up during the time of, of that we are speaking of judgment and the sixth trumpet. Murders. Folks, I am telling you, it is happening every day. People are killing people for no reason. I read the other day, or maybe I heard it on the news, where two guys got in a fight over their laundry. I, I know I heard that. And one of them went and got their guns and shot him dead because of laundry. Folks, I am telling you, that's pathetic that we devalue human life that much. Murder, sorceries, anything to do with evil. And I'm telling you, these games, you better watch what games you're... And i tell you one thing, I, this is the truth. And I know people aren't going to like this, but I'm going to say it anyway. These games where we just kill one another that sets in someone's mind, especially influencing youth, that it's okay to kill somebody. So when they get mad at somebody, they just do what they do. They're playing their video game. Sorceries, drugs, alcohol, all comes into that. Sexual immorality, I don't even have to say. The sin of homosexuality. This transgender, folks, I am telling you, God made man and woman, all right? Man and woman, and we have no right to change who God made us to be. And then the last one, thefts. And you say, thefts go on all the time. But I'm telling you, during the tribulation, it's going to be even worse. Why? Because food is going to become scarce. Water is going to become scarce. These things are going on. And folks, I'm telling you, it's going to turn into martial law. You're going to see things that you have never seen before and never heard of before. And that's what he is saying here. He's just saying, man, 
as these fifth and sixth and seventh trumpet goes on, God is saying, enough is enough. And God needs the church to be the church. Look with me to James. James chapter 4. James 4. Verse 4. And this is James speaking to the people at that church. You adulterers and adulteresses. Uh, we don't have to guess about what that is. <laughs> Folks, this ruins families. This ruins lives. Adultery and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. I want to make a spiritual comparison. Yes, adulterers and adulteresses. It is totally wrong. It wrecks families. It, it destroys trust. But do you know what? I believe you can also say this. Uh, to our relationship with God. We have cheated on God. We have done things blatantly knowing, knowing that it is not right what we are doing, but we do it anyway. Folks, we need to understand we are the light. People watch everything we do. People watch everything we say. People watch where we go, and people watch how we react. And there are Christians, even today, that are cheating on God. Verse 5, or do you think that Scripture says in vain, the Spirit who dwells in us, us yearn uh, jealously? Folks, the Old Testament especially talks about a jealous God. He don't want us cheating on Him. He wants us to be number one in His life. Verse 6, but He gives more grace. Therefore, he says, and there's three sins that I believe that we as Christians battle every day of our lives. Number one is the sin of pride. Look at this. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Folks, it was pride that got Satan kicked out of heaven. It is pride that makes you feel like you're better than someone else. It is pride is, is something where you it won't come out of your mouth. I am sorry. I was wrong. Please forgive me. When is the last time you've asked for somebody's forgiveness? We sin, folks. We sin whether it's my wife or my children or my grandchildren or people that I talk to or talk with. We need to confess our sins and ask forgiveness. Not that we're confessing them to Him, but we're confessing them to God. And if we have hurt someone, we need to make that right. And pride says, no, you don't have to do that. Look at verse 7. Therefore, submit to God. What's submission mean? Come under the authority of God. Folks, this is, this is where we live. This is who we are. This is what James is saying. Submit to God. Resist the devil. Say no. Say no. One of Eve's biggest problems in Genesis chapter 3, she just started talking to him. I mean, could she not recognize that was the devil? Could she not figure out this is not going to turn out good? Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Look what he says. Draw near to God. How do we draw near to God? We go to church. We read our Bible outside of church. We pray every day. We confess our sins every day. We share our testimonies in the gospel when God gives us opportunity. Draw near to God. Look at this. Cleanse your hands. Folks, there's dirty hands. Dirty hands. And if I've not been taught anything else by my mom and my grandma, don't you come to this table with dirty hands. Don't do it. Folks, the spiritual con connotation is we've got dirty hands. Cleanse them. Get right with God. Put God first and foremost in your, in your life. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts. Folks, it starts in the mind. And when that seed is planted in our mind, if we don't get rid of that seed of sin and that seed of temptation, we are going to sin. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. And it's not that we got two minds. 
It's that we think two different ways depending on the situation. There are times when I'm a good, good, good Christian. And then there's other times that I'm, I'm just thinking, and, and I'm talking to myself, you idiot. You are a moron. Why did you say that? Why are you doing this again? Lament and mourn and weep. Folks, we, we should. We should weep over our sin. I think we should weep over our country, folks. When I think of growing up 50-something years ago, and the way it was then and the way it is now, it breaks my heart. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy into gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Well, folks, humbleness is what God is looking for. The three sins is pride. The second sin is self-reliance. Now you say God's first in your life, but you live like you are your own boss. There's a song, and you will know what this song says, and you will know who sang it. I did it my way. And guess what he did? He died. Okay? You can't do it your way and live for Christ. And the third sin, I'm telling you, this is just sin entitlement. Entitlement. Let me say something. God owes you nothing. If you have salvation, if He has offered you forgiveness of all your sin, He owes you nothing. We're living in His world. We're breathing His air. We're eating His food. He gives us our salary. He gives us our homes. He does these things. He doesn't owe you anything. But when we think of the spiritual side of things, He gives us everything. Folks, I'm telling you, this world is getting worse and worse and worse. And what we need more than anything else is a huge dose of Jesus and Christians that will walk every day saying, I don't care who I offend. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care if you judge me. I'm going to live according to the Word of God. And I'm going to obey God in everything I do. And folks, I'm telling you, during the tribulation time, it will literally cost, your life, cost you your life if you do that. Most likely, it will cost you your life. But right now, it's free, folks. It's grace. We are living under the grace of God. And if you've never, ever given your heart and your soul to Christ, today would be a good day to do that. Father, thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your word. Man, your word is right. It is yes, it is amen. And God, I just, I don't know, my burden is for Christians today. I, I pray somebody will get saved today. But my burden is for Christians today. We look like the world. We act like the world. We talk like the world. God, we're supposed to be in the world, but not of the world. So God, I pray that you would just convict our hearts. God, I pray that we would just repent of the sin of pride the sin of entitlement. And God, I pray that you would just convict our hearts with these things and, and the things that your word says. And God, self-reliance, we can't do everything. I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me. So God, this is your invitation. This is your time. We love you. We praise you. We thank you for what you're doing. God, this is your church. This is uh, your spirit. So God, would you speak to us? And God, when you speak, I, I, I pray we would say, God, I hear. God, I hear. And with your help, I'm going to change. God, change our hearts. Change our minds. Change our words. And change our actions. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. If God has spoke to you anyway, if you need to come for baptism, 
If you need to come for church membership, whatever you need to do, you come as you stand to your feet.